Welcome to a Stormy Podcast. Here we explore events, conspiracies, and realities, often with guests on both sides of the mic, both sides of issues, and willing to challenge and explore and discuss events, conspiracies, and even realities from both new and old perspectives. Let's dive in. Today we're tackling something pretty big, you know, the whole individual rights versus collective action thing. Yeah, that's a big one. And it's especially timely, I think, like, you know, with all the stuff coming out from C40 Cities, the World Economic Forum. Right. But you also sent over a bunch of sources on, like, feudalism and limited government Uh and even the Second Amendment. Yes. It's a lot. But I'm ready to dive in if you are. Absolutely. It's a really fascinating mix of stuff. So let's start with these C40 and WDF documents. Um, I got to say, they're a little intimidating. You know, they paint these big grand pictures of the future. But it's not always clear what that means, like practically for everyday people. Yeah, that's a really great point. And that's really where this tension between the individual and the collective, I think, starts to come into focus. So like take C40 cities, for example, their goal is to combat climate change, which is a good thing, right? Right. But the way they propose to do it involves some pretty, uh, pretty big changes. Yeah. Like they talk about switching to like net zero carbon buildings and building a circular economy. Sounds great on paper. What's that actually mean for someone who lives in, say, a small apartment in a big city? Well, net zero carbon buildings could mean like really strict regulations on energy use, maybe renovations to make your apartment more energy efficient, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe even restrictions on what kind of appliances you can have or even what materials they're made of. Mm -hmm. And a circular economy really focuses on like reducing waste, reusing resources. So that could mean changes to packaging, product design, even how you get rid of your trash. So basically, even if you agree with the goal, like fighting climate change, it could still impact you in a lot of ways. What you buy, how you heat your home, even how you get around. Exactly. And it's not just about individual choices either. It needs governments, corporations, and regular people to work together. Which is where the World Economic Forum comes in, right? Yeah. They seem even more focused on these big partnerships, global solutions. Yeah, the WEF is definitely taking a broader approach. They're looking at climate change, economic inequality, all the ways technology is changing things, uh, you name it. And they're all about public-private partnerships and getting everyone to the table to solve these problems. So if C40 is focused on the city level, the WEF is thinking globally. Pretty much, yeah. And they both seem to really put the collective first, you know? At least in terms of how they see solutions being implemented. Which makes it even more important to look at these proposals through the lens of individual rights. And that's where I think these other sources come in. Feudalism, limited government, free speech. Yeah. They all kind of push back against this idea of top-down control, don't they? Definitely. They offer a really different perspective. They remind us that individual liberty is, uh, it's not something to be taken lightly. It's actually the foundation of a fair and prosperous society. Okay, so let's break that down a little. Yeah. You brought up feudalism earlier. I'm not a history expert or anything, but... Isn't that like a system where people were tied to the land and had very little freedom? What's that got to do with the WEF, for example? It's a good question. I mean, on the surface, yeah, they seem worlds apart. But what's interesting about comparing them is this. It makes us think about how power works. In a feudal system, you were bound to whoever was above you. You didn't have a lot of say in things and you couldn't really disagree. Hmm. So the question is, are we headed towards some sort of new feudalism where we're all at the mercy of these powerful global organizations? Maybe not to that extreme, but it's worth thinking about, right? Like if these powerful groups like the WBF or C40 cities keep pushing for collective action, Could we lose some of our individual freedoms if we're not careful? Especially if those in charge think they know best and just start making decisions without thinking about our choices or rights. Right. And that's exactly where the idea of limited government comes in. It basically says that the government's power shouldn't be unlimited, that there are things that the government just shouldn't be involved in. That makes sense. And that idea is at the heart of documents like the U.S. Constitution, which was designed to prevent tyranny and protect individual liberty. And that protection includes things like free speech, right? 
which I think is more important than ever, yeah. you know, especially with how information is controlled and sometimes even manipulated by both governments and big corporations. Absolutely. Free speech is so important. It's how we question authority, how we hold those in power accountable. It's how we share ideas, even unpopular ones, so we can debate and hopefully get to the truth. But free speech seems to be under attack a lot these days. Like, we're seeing more and more attempts to censor certain viewpoints online, you know, yeah. and people being silenced for being politically incorrect mm -hmm. and even using financial stuff to target people who have unpopular opinions. It is a worrisome trend. A lot of the sources you sent over really highlight that. They say that silencing people, even if you think they're wrong or saying harmful things, is actually a bad idea. It can be dangerous. Yeah, because who gets to decide what's offensive or harmful? It seems like that kind of power could easily be misused, you know, especially if it's in the hands of just a few. Exactly. The way to fight bad speech isn't by censoring it. It's with more speech, more open debate, more critical thinking. In a free society, hopefully the truth will win out. That's a good point. Sure. It also ties in with another theme in these sources. Individual rights are important for everyone, not just the majority, but especially for minorities who might be vulnerable to what they call the tyranny of the majority. Yeah, exactly. Think about it. The rights of minorities, like racial minorities, religious minorities, any kind of minority, they can be ignored if the majority just gets to decide everything. So even if most people think something is right, it doesn't necessarily mean it is, especially if it steps on the basic rights of others. Exactly. And that's why protecting individual liberty is so important. It's not just about the majority. It's about making sure everyone, regardless of their background or beliefs, has the freedom to live their lives according to their own conscience. And that brings us to what might be the most controversial source you sent, the one about the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. I know this is a hot button topic, mm -hmm. but you specifically asked us to look at it in a certain way. Yes, I did. The question you posed is, is the right to bear arms a radical idea? And to answer that, we kind of have to go back in time, right? Right. So think about it. At the time America was founded, the idea that regular people should be able to have guns, you know, to potentially defend themselves against their own government, that was a radical idea. Totally different from the idea that only the ruling class should have weapons. Absolutely. The Second Amendment was about giving power to the people. It was saying that the people have the right to resist tyranny, even if that tyranny is coming from their own government. In a way, it was the ultimate expression of individual empowerment. So it might not seem as radical today, but in the context of its time, yeah, it was a pretty big deal. It was basically saying, we the people have the power and we will defend our freedom. And that idea that the people ultimately have the power, not the government or any other powerful entity, is still relevant today, even if how we defend that power has changed. So you're saying the Second Amendment even though it's about guns, is really a metaphor for something much bigger. Maybe, yeah. It's a reminder that individual liberty is precious and requires us to be vigilant, courageous, and willing to stand up for what we believe in, even when it's tough, even when it's not popular. It's a strong message. And it brings us back to what we've been talking about today, this whole individual rights versus collective action thing. It's a constant back and forth. We need to be both thoughtful and brave to find the right balance. And it's a conversation that's not over. We've barely scratched the surface, but I think looking at these sources together is helping us to see this whole debate more clearly. I definitely feel like I'm learning a lot, but I gotta say, I'm also feeling a little overwhelmed with all this information. Yeah, I get that. It is a lot to process. It is, it is a lot to think about. But I guess that's what a deep dive is all about, right? Yeah. Sometimes you gotta push past that feeling of like, in information overload yeah. to really get these complex ideas. Right. And I think what makes this one extra tricky is it's not just about different ideas. It's about this fundamental tension. Individual rights versus collective action. It's like this tug of war that's been going on forever, and it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Exactly. And you can see it everywhere, like in the climate change debates, concerns about censorship and all that surveillance stuff even what it means to be a citizen in today's world. Okay, so how about we bring this back to the documents you brought? We were talking about how the C40 cities and WEF proposals, you know, maybe they clash with some of these ideas about individual liberty. 
Any concrete examples of that? Oh, yeah. Tons. Like, think about how C40 Cities wants to drastically cut down on meat consumption. They say, you know, raising livestock is a huge contributor to greenhouse gases. So they want cities to adopt policies to discourage people from eating meat, like maybe meatless Mondays in schools or government buildings. Right. So that's a specific example of a collective action being proposed to tackle a global issue. But where's the conflict with individual rights? Well, for one thing, it raises the question of choice. What you eat is pretty personal, right? It can be tied to culture, religion, or just what you like. So the question is, should individuals get to decide for themselves, or does the collective good, like in this case, reducing those emissions, trump individual preferences? That's a tough one. Because on one hand, yeah, we need to change how we live to tackle climate change. I get that. But on the other hand, it feels a bit off to have someone tell me what I can and can't eat. Right. And that's exactly the heart of the dilemma. Where's the line between freedom and responsibility? Who decides and how do we make sure those decisions respect everyone, not just the majority? You know, it's funny. When we talked about feudalism before, it seemed like such an ancient thing. Yeah. Totally irrelevant to our lives now. But looking at these C40 and WEF ideas, it makes me wonder if we're seeing a new kind of feudalism, you know, maybe not literally, but in terms of how power is concentrated, how individual choices are being squeezed. That's an interesting thought. Are we becoming more and more dependent on these big, powerful organizations to solve our problems, tell us how to live? And if so, what happens to individual liberty? Honestly, it's a bit unsettling. Like we're trading our freedom for security or convenience, or maybe just the hope that someone else will figure it all out. And that's where those sources on limited government and individual rights are so important. They remind us that we can't just sit back and let others decide. We have to be citizens who think critically, participate in the conversation, and hold those in power accountable. So it's not enough to just hope for the best. We have to actively shape our own destiny, both individually and as a group. Exactly. And that might mean challenging those in power, whether it's government officials, corporate bigwigs, or even the leaders of well-meaning groups like C40 or the WEF. We can't assume they have all the answers or that their solutions are good for everyone. We need to be skeptical, right? Ask tough questions, demand transparency, and hold their feet to the fire. Exactly. And that's where free speech is so important. If we can't disagree, if we can't challenge the status quo, if we can't speak truth to power, then we're really just playing by someone else's rules. And it's not just about saying what you think. It's also about getting information, hearing different sides of the story, having real, honest debates. Yeah. That's how we find solutions that work for everyone, not just a select few. Couldn't agree more. That's why those examples of censorship and all that surveillance stuff you mentioned are so worrying. It's like they're trying to block the flow of information, which is the foundation of a democratic society. Right. It's like that saying, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Open debate, critical thinking, exposing corruption and abuse of power. That's how we create a more just and equal society. Absolutely. And that's also why protecting individual rights, especially for minorities, is so crucial. History shows us that when you start chipping away at individual liberty, it's usually the most vulnerable who get hurt the most. And it's not just history. We see this happening right now all over the world. Places where free speech is shut down, where disagreeing with the government is a crime, where minorities are targeted. It's a stark reminder that the fight for individual liberty is never truly over. You're right. We have to stay vigilant and speak up against injustice wherever we see it. Which brings us back to that uh, potentially controversial idea we touched on earlier, the right to bear arms. Right. The Second Amendment. I got to admit, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how it fits into all of this. We're talking about climate change, these global organizations, the future of democracy, and then guns. Well, remember what we talked about with the Second Amendment's history? It came from a deep distrust of concentrated power and the belief that the people should have the ultimate power. So it's not just about, like, personal self-defense. It's about being able to resist tyranny, whether it's from some foreign invader or from a government that's become too powerful and overreaching. Exactly. The specific threats to individual liberty may change over time, but the basic principle stays the same. Free people need a way to defend their freedom, and that includes the right to bear arms. Okay, I'm starting to see the connection. But it still feels a little extreme to think about armed citizens as the solution to all these problems we're talking about. I get that. It's complicated, and there are good points to be made on both sides. But the founders of this country, they really believed that an armed citizenry was crucial for keeping freedom alive. They saw it as a way to make sure the government stayed accountable to the people. So it's not about promoting violence or chaos. 
It's about giving individuals the power to protect themselves and their communities from anyone who tries to take away their freedom. Exactly. And even though people might disagree about how to protect that freedom, the principle is clear. Individual liberty is precious. We need to be vigilant, courageous, and ready to stand up for what we believe in, even when it's hard, even when it's not popular. And sometimes that means being willing to fight for your freedom, both literally and figuratively. Yeah, that's right. And that fight takes many forms. Speaking out against injustice, challenging those in power, learning and teaching, and yes, even being ready to defend yourself and your community when you have to. This deep dive is really making me question things and think differently. And you've done a great job tying all these different sources together from the C40 and WEF stuff to the whole history and philosophy of individual liberty. It's been a really interesting exploration. I'm glad we could dive into this together. Me too. This has been a lot though. I feel like we need a minute to let it all sink in. Yeah, definitely. While they're on break, I have a job to do, which is please like and subscribe. We hope you are getting some thought provoking ideas from the discussion. Let's get back to it. Welcome back. Man, we've covered a ton of ground today from C40 cities and the World Economic Forum to like the roots of individual liberty, even the Second Amendment. It's been a wild ride. It really has. We've taken all these different ideas and, you know, found some surprising connections. What really stands out to me is how this whole individual rights versus collective action thing. Yeah. It's not just some theoretical debate anymore. It's really shaping our world. Absolutely. It's at the heart of a lot of the big issues we face. From those C40 and WEF proposals to, like you said, censorship, surveillance, the whole thing. So as we wrap up, any advice on how to navigate all of this? Like as individuals, we're being pulled in so many directions. How do we make choices that, you know, reflect our values, protect our freedoms? That's the question, isn't it? It's not easy. But I think it starts with being aware, aware of, you know, what's going on, the different viewpoints, the potential consequences of our choices, both as individuals and as a society. So first step is to educate ourselves, really understand these issues and how they affect us. Exactly. And that means going deeper than just the headlines, right? Find different sources of information. Talk to people who disagree with you. Be willing to challenge your own assumptions, even if it makes you uncomfortable. Because that's where real learning happens, right? When you yeah. get out of your comfort zone and, you know, really engage with different ideas. Exactly. And it's not just about learning. It's also about getting involved, participating in your community, speaking out against things that are wrong, holding those in power accountable. So we can't just sit back and complain. We have to actually do something to create the kind of world we want. Right. And that can look different for everyone. It might mean voting, contacting your representative, supporting organizations you believe in, maybe even running for office yourself. And being willing to stand up for what you think is right, even if it's unpopular, even if it's risky. Yeah. And sometimes that means being willing to defend your freedoms, not just with words, but with actions. Remember what we were saying about the Second Amendment? Right. The founders really believed that having the right to bear arms was essential to protect against tyranny. So it's not just about like protecting your home from burglars. It's about having a way to push back against oppression, mm -hmm. whether that's a government that's become too controlling or any other group trying to take away our freedoms. Exactly. How we defend our freedoms is debatable, but the principle is the same. Free people have to be able to protect their liberty. It's a heavy thought, but it's also empowering. We have a responsibility to protect our own freedoms and the freedoms of those who come after us. You know, when we were talking about those C40 and WEEF documents, I was struck by how much they emphasized collective action, you know, finding global solutions for global problems. And while collaboration is important, I also worry about these big, powerful groups overstepping their boundaries. I get that. It's a balancing act for sure. How do we tackle these huge challenges without losing the individual freedoms that make life worth living? That's the big question. No easy answers, but I think it comes down to remembering that the individual is the foundation of society. A good society respects the rights of its people and helps them live according to their own values. So even as we work together to solve these big, complex problems, we have to be mindful of the individual. Think about the real world impact of our decisions. Exactly. We have to watch out for solutions that sound good on paper, but could end up hurting individual freedom. Be skeptical of those who claim to have all the answers and try to force their ideas on everyone else. And we have to be brave enough to defend our freedoms for ourselves and for future generations. Well said. I think that's a perfect place to end. This conversation about individual rights and collective action isn't going away. We all have a role to play in figuring it out.
Thanks for guiding us through this. You've given me a lot to think about, and I'm sure our listeners are feeling the same way. It's been great. And remember, the deep dive never really ends. There's always more to discover, to learn, to There you have it. So keep We don't always agree with our guests, but listening to them is always interesting. And keep fighting for a world where individual liberty thrives. We hope you got something out of this and we'll come back to hear more as we upload conversations of interest. Thanks for listening.